Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luis Leon. I'm a vascular surgeon in Tucson, Arizona, one of the 20 some vascular surgeons in our city and one of seven out of uh, uh, my group in uh, Pima Heart and Vascular. Um, I want to thank Tucson Medical Center for the kind invitation to present um, this uh, brief talk on carotid artery revascularization and strokes. Um, I was told this is the fifth talk of the medical series, and so I'm gonna ask for your forgiveness if something um, doesn't transmit well or there's some fumbling in this presentation, but um, all I can tell you is we're hoping to do our best and transmit this in the best possible way. So um, just to say that I have no disclosures with respect to this presentation. Can you please pass the slides? Next. We're here talking about stroke, and stroke happens to be Depends on the year and depends what you read, but happens to be about the third or the fifth cause of death in this country. Um, when you consider people that are older than 70, uh, it happens to be a much higher uh, risk of death, second to heart attack and second to uh, accidents. I'm not sure how you feel about strokes, but I myself feel that probably sometimes death is better than having a survival. But the fact is 80% of people survive a stroke. Next. The problem is that a lot of those people actually will survive without any deficits, but most of them, four out of five survivors, will have some sort of disability. What are the numbers? Every 100,000 people or 100,000 um, US citizens, you have 200 that will have a stroke. And when you consider people that are over 75 years of age, that prevalence or occurrence goes up eightfold. What are the absolute numbers? It's been calculated that about 2 million people in this country are actually stroke survivors. The stroke can be caused by multiple causes. The stroke can be actually coming from the heart. We can have unknown causes, but the point of a vascular surgeon giving this talk is that up to 4 out of 10, 40% of people will have a cause directly located in the neck, and that's called atherosclerosis of the carotid arteries. What is a stroke? Uh, most people will know that stroke is a sudden onset of difficulty uh, speaking, weakness or numbness of one arm or one leg, numbness or tingling, fall into one side or the other, or it can be vision uh, problems, like sudden loss of vision in one eye that actually resolves a few minutes or hours after. Now there's an acronym, next please, called FAST, and this is what, a quick way to remember that uh, if you have any facial uh, differences and you ask a person to smile if there is a facial droop the patient might be having a stroke the arms if you ask a patient who you think is having a stroke to extend the arms and one of them drifts down the patient might be having a stroke speech if you ask this person to actually say something and the patient either cannot speak or the speak is garbled then the patient might be having a stroke and the T happens to be really important because this is a matter of time. If you get a patient having a stroke to the hospital within a certain time, which is usually minutes to an hour, then the patient can be candidate for a procedure that can be life-saving and can be diminished the uh, deficits in the future. So FAST is a good acronym. Now, there's a term that is frequently mentioned by doctors and, and even patients, it's called a TIA. And TIA stands for transient ischemic attacks. What's the difference between a TIA and a stroke? A TIA is a deficit that lasts up to 24 hours. So all those deficits that correct before 24 hours are called a TIA, whereas a stroke is a deficit that persists a day or more after. So a patient who has trouble speaking but then corrects the speech within a day, that's a TIA. A stroke is that patient who remains with that problem for over a day. Now, what's the relationship? Some people might say, well, I had a TIA and that resolved and I'm okay. They're not okay. You can see that a TIA, a week after, has about 4% chances of having a major stroke uh, after the incidence or, or the, the onset of a TIA. As you see, as time goes by, the chances of a stroke are much higher. You can see that a year after, 13% of people having a TIA may have a massive stroke, and five years after, one out of three people who had a TIA will have a stroke. Another important number is that disease of the carotid artery does not mean that the disease is only located in the neck. This is an expression of a disease that affects the whole body, and you can see that 
a third of patients that are afflicted by carotid atherosclerosis will have a heart attack within the next three years, which is a, a pretty ominous uh, statistic. Next. Next. You can see that in the causes of a stroke, next please, 60%, like I indicated earlier, is actually due to atherosclerosis or hardening or plaque buildup of the carotid arteries, and that's what uh, vascular surgeons like me uh, get usually called for. Next. This is what we're talking about. When we, in surgery, open the patient's arteries and remove the material that causes a stroke, you can see this is how it looks. It's a hard plaque. Sometimes it's like cement that you can actually scrape from a wall what's building up inside the patient's uh, arteries. And a piece of this plaque will go up to the brain and block the circulation of one of the brain territories, and that will affect the function of the arms, of the legs, of the speech, and so forth. Next. This is a um, magnification, and you can see the plaque, and we are putting here these forceps to indicate that there is blood flow through that plaque, and so pieces of this plaque can actually be dislodged from this area and go towards the brain and cause a stroke. Next. Some people feel that when the blockage is severe, intuitively you might think that it's the reduction of blood flow to your brain that will cause a stroke, and that is not true. Most of the strokes are caused not by reduction of blood flow, but what we call an embolic problem. And that is a piece of that plaque will break and go up to your brain and give you the stroke. It's not because the blood flow is not reaching your brain because of the blockage. It's actually a piece of the blockage will break and go up, and that's what's called an embolic problem. Next. How do we diagnose this? This is actually the first, the most readily available method to diagnose how much plaque the patients have in the neck is a sonogram, an ultrasound. And an ultrasound is cheap, is completely harmless, and it can give you a really good information as to how much plaque you have and how much blockage you have. This is an old, this is, um, you can go back. This is an old um, probe. And now, actually, the probes are much smaller, much slicker, and we can get diagnosis based on these images uh, of uh, gray and white that tells us, if you can see right here, this is the carotid artery, and you can see how black should be normal, but here, this half moon indicates buildup of plaque, and that can break and go up to your brain. So that's how we diagnose. Next, we have also, next, we have also CAT scans. You can see how these are actually slices of your brain that tell us exactly the status of the carotid arteries. You, if you ever have had a CAT scan, you know you have to go to a tube, and it's a very rapid test. The problem is that it requires an IV, IV injection of contrast to be able to image the carotid. So contrast can damage your kidneys. There's radiation involved, so it's a little more involved than ultrasound, but it's a very good test. Next. 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 Magnetic resonance uh, MRA is another technique even much more involved because it's a lengthier procedure. People with claustrophobia have a hard time um, going through the machine and staying in the machine for so long. So, uh, but this is actually preferred by some uh, physicians. Next. Uh, angiography, next. It's, uh, this actually involves placing a catheter from the groin usually and putting it all the way up to the neck artery and inject dye. Dye is seen black on the screen and the black you uh, will actually, the lack of black color in a vessel will tell you that there's a blockage in that, in that artery. Next, next, next. Intravascular ultrasound is a technique that is relatively new, but basically we're able now to place an ultrasound machine at the tip of a catheter, and we can advance that catheter and we can get images from within the blood vessel. Next, I'm gonna show you next, right there in the middle, you can see those are images from within a carotid artery that tells us exactly in two dimensions what the blockage and the characteristics of the plaque is. Plaque can be really hard, like cement, or can be really soft, like sand on the beach. And there's a difference. The cement plaque is thought by us that it doesn't, it doesn't break too often. But if you have plaque or buildup that looks like sand in the beach, you can imagine that some of that sand can dislodge very easily and go up to the brain. Next. Next. And next. Um, now, really briefly about indications. There's two large groups of patients with carotid disease. Patients who come with no symptoms, and their physicians order a test for another reason, and they found that there's a blockage. But the patient is living fine. 
Those are people that we call asymptomatic, which means no symptoms. The other group, the more involved group, are the patients that get a study because they had a stroke or a TIA. Let's say that the patient two days ago couldn't speak for half an hour, and they go to the primary care physician, they report those symptoms, the primary care physician orders a sonogram, and they find a blockage. So two large groups of people, asymptomatic with no symptoms and symptomatic with symptoms. What do we know? You can see these newspaper cuts. That on the left is a newspaper cut from 1991. So this is information we have for over 30 years now. The surgery works really well when a patient comes with a symptom. So there is no question in most surgeons' minds that when a patient comes with a symptom, there is a benefit of doing surgery in the neck because you reduce the chances of a stroke by a lot. Now, you can see how much this was. So the, the trial that compared surgery versus medication only for people with symptoms had to be stopped because the difference, the benefit was so dramatically bigger in the surgical arm that they decided it's unethical to continue this trial just giving pills to a person with symptoms. So in our minds, there is no question that surgery is beneficial for a patient with symptoms. The problem is the patients without symptoms. What do you do with a 65-year-old person who comes to your office with a 99% blockage of the artery, but the patient is living fine. The patient is walking, is living, is happy. And so what do you do next? You can see there's a thousand papers trying to decide which one of those patients will benefit from surgery. And that's a really critical question. And that's the topic of a separate discussion. You can take hours talking about the indications of surgery for a patient without symptoms. Next history of how do we fix these arteries. You can see that this goes back to 1951. A surgeon in Argentina, Dr. Raul Carrera, uh, Argentina, by the way, I'm from Peru, but Argentina has given a lot of um, contributions in the medical field in several aspects, including carotid surgery. Dr. Carrera was the first one who actually revascularized or fixed a carotid lesion. You can see 1953 in London, Dr. Escott and other surgeons um, did another a type of surgery, but the operation that we know standard of care as of today was first done in Houston by Dr. Michael DeBakey. That's the first carotid endarterectomy in 1953. So we have an operation that is 70 plus years. We have a long track record and it's a really good operation as we wanna see. As everything else, people start coming out with minimally invasive techniques. They felt that we didn't need to cut somebody's neck to fix the, fix the artery. And the first person who actually used a balloon to open the blockage was in 1977, Dr. Matthias. And then Dr. Dietrich, actually an hour and a half north from us in Phoenix, was the first physician who put a stent in the carotid artery in the year 1996. Many trials came after. Dr. Parodi, another Argentinian surgeon who changed the history of vascular surgery with aortic surgery in many other areas, he came up with a very interesting concept that we want to touch. And what brings me here today is the emergence of this new procedure called TCAR, or known as TCAR, which began only five years ago. Next. Next. Like I said, uh, next. This is actually next. Next. This is a historic slide that tells you 1954 in London, at St. Mary's Hospital, one of the probably the most prestigious institutions in the medical field in the world. Um, this is the operation that that patient at attack well received in 1954, the first um, carotid reconstruction um, it, uh, successful. So 1954, like I said, is an operation that we have a 70 year track record next. Now, I mentioned that Dr. Ted Dietrich in Phoenix came up with the first carotid stenting. What's carotid stenting? It's basically advancing a stent from the groin, going up the belly, up the chest, into the neck, and placing a metal tube to push the plaque to the side. So surgery involves removing the plaque with our hands, so the plaque is gone. Stent is placing a tube in the middle of the plaque, pushing the plaque to the side, allowing blood flow to the brain. So there is a difference. Now, you can tell already, when you advance a catheter, this is actually the patient's chest and this is the neck. So when you place a catheter from the groin, you have to traverse with a catheter the belly, the chest. But you can see that there is disease, there is plaque buildup in all that path towards the neck. So when you advance these catheters to try to put a stent, you can actually drag some of this plaque and push it up by trying to advance the stent. So there is a risk 
the, of advancing the plaque not on purpose and causing a stroke while you're trying to fix a lesion. So initially, that's how people did. People advanced catheters and pushed some of that plaque to the brain. Somebody says, we cannot continue doing this because it's too much. The, the number of strokes that we're causing by trying to fix this is too high. So they actually came up with the concept of a filter. You see, a filter is an umbrella that is placed right here in the neck. So when you are manipulating this lesion or this buildup, if something breaks loose, it will be caught by that filter. The problem is that to put this filter, you still have to cross the blockage. And when you cross the blockage with a wire, you can send some of this to the brain and cause a stroke. So next, this is an example of a lesion. You can see here on the left, a blockage. See, black is good, black is contrast. But see, when you have these white filling defects in the artery, that tells you that there's a problem, there's a blockage. This is before and this is after. You can see that the stent has been placed, pushing the plaque to the side, allowing blood flow to the brain. Next. This is a, macro, a magnification of the stents. These are tubes that are made by the industry. They are strong enough that you can actually put them inside the plaque and move it to the side. Next. Again, another angiogram. You can see on the left, you can see this is normal. Why this normal? And here there's a very, there's like a, a very thin area of passage of blood to the brain. And this is after the stent. So you can see a, quite a difference before and after. Next. Obviously, with this, when these stents came up, people naturally start comparing what's, what's best, open surgery or stenting. So we have, I'm going to go over a few studies really quickly. This is the first study that actually was designed 10 years ago. 10 years ago, the study named CREST was designed that compared open surgery versus placing a stent. And what did we find? We found that the stent was not inferior to, to open surgery. So people started being encouraged to place stents because they were saying this is not, doesn't give us bad results comparing to open surgery. But when you see the numbers, there were much more patients. CAS is um, identifying stents. CEA is open surgery. When you see the numbers, there were much more patients having a stroke with stenting than open surgery. When we open somebody's neck, we put a big old clamp before moving the plaque, and so that plaque, the plaque cannot go to the patient's brain. So it's sort of a safe way to avoid problems with embolic material going to the brain. When you put a stent, you cannot put a clamp, and obviously the numbers are high. So this is what this showed. Even though the two techniques were not dramatically different, there was higher numbers of strokes when you tried to put a stent. Next. Dr. Leon, there's a question. <clears throat> Carla asks, I have a question in regards to the different methods you're talking about. Does the doctor choose which methods are adequate for each patient, depending on the severity or the preference? Because of the severity or the preference of the doctor? That's a very, that's a very good question. And let me, let, me, let me answer that with an example. To me, the decision of one versus another begins with you choosing the doctor that can offer all three techniques I'm going to talk about. Meaning that if you call a handyman to your house and that handyman and that handyman's only tool is a hammer, he'll be able to actually hang pictures on your room, but he will not be able to fix a leak on the faucet. So to start the answer to that question is you have to actually choose somebody who can perform all three procedures I'm going to mention, number one. And then when that person can actually perform all three procedures proficiently, then that patient will choose the procedure to the patient. You don't offer one procedure, because there's a lot of physicians who can only do one of the three, and will apply that to every patient that comes their way. That, to me, is the wrong thing to do for your relatives, for yourself. To me, you have to choose somebody who can actually perform all three, and then that physician can actually adjust the procedure to the patient, not the patients adjust to, to every procedure. And I'm going I'm to... Um, Discuss us a little further. Uh, next, please. Now, this is a fascinating study. And this was really cool to see because this, this was a very involved study. You can see that they studied 120 patients that had stents versus 100 patients that had open surgery. And what they did was a massive diagnostic study. They actually did MRIs. So they imaged the brain before the procedure was done, and then a day after, seven days after, and weeks after. And they saw that when you do carotid open surgery, you found little pieces of plaque that went to the brain in about one fifteen out of 100. 
But when you put a stent, 50 out of 100 had blockages that went to the brain. So this was, to me, you can see this patient had this, this white area represents a piece of plaque that went to block the circulation to the brain. This patient can be completely asymptomatic. This may be blocking flow to an area of the brain that doesn't control anything. So this patient, even though there's a lesion, be, can be talking and moving and functioning okay. But this study demonstrated that looking with a very good imaging technique, dramatically bigger number of patients after stenting will have actually showering of plaque into the brain. Next. Now, of course, open surgery is plagued with their own flaws, and that is obviously the nerves that connect your brain to your body run through the nerve, to, through the neck. And so when you go from the groin, you're working from within the blood vessels, and those nerves are not at risk. When you do a cut with open surgery, you, if you don't know where they are, you can actually cut them and interrupt the nerves that control, for instance, the motion of your tongue, the nerves that control the movement of your diaphragm, so you can have problems breathing, you can, have, you can actually damage the nerves that control your voice, and for a singer, you can have permanent hoarseness. So open surgery has its own risks. Next. This is a new procedure that is about five years old, and it's called TCAR, or transcervical carotid revascularization. I told you that the caveat of going from the groin is the fact that you cross a lot of artery with disease, and, try, and you could send some of that plaque to the brain. Somebody came up with this concept. We don't have to go from the groin to put a stent. Now what we do is a little cut, please play it, at the bottom of the neck, and then we put a, the stent through that little cut, avoiding going from the groin to the neck. This is how we do it. We make a little cut one inch long, right above the clavicle, and expose the artery here below the blockage. The blockage is right here. We put a plastic tube directly right here, and the unique characteristic of this procedure is that normally, when you put a stem from the groin, the blood flow goes towards the brain. This procedure is designed to reverse the flow to go from the brain to the outside of the body before you touch the blockage. And so if you are manipulating the blockage and some of that debris or plaque breaks, it will go outside of your body into a tubing system that has a filter in the middle. So any possibility of plaque breaking up going to your brain is eliminated by reversing the flow in that side. And we do that in a, it's a series of connection of tubes that allows us to do that, that it would be too long to explain for this presentation. But so you have to know that those risks that we had by placing a stem from the groin and pushing plaque to the brain are actually avoided by reversing the flow from the brain to the outside of the patient. You see in the end, there's a very small scar that actually is under the, the color, the shirt, and it's much more cosmetically appealing than doing a cut as before. Next. This is sort of a scheme that shows what I'm trying to say, which is here's the little cut in the neck, but there's a tubing system that goes in the outside of the patient connected to the vein of the patient's groin. So the artery here has a very high pressure, and the veins have very low pressure. So when we do that tubing connection, the blood goes from high pressure to blood pressure. So what happens is the blood from the brain goes out into the patient's groin, into the patient's system. So next. These are examples, six examples of patients that we have done at Tucson Medical Center. Next. This is an example of this procedure. Look at it, such a tight, severe lesion here. Black, like I told you, is good. There's basically barely flow going to the brain. And then this is after we put a stent. But look what happens. Look at all this yellowish piece in the filter. Is the stuff, is the buildup that was in the artery that would have gone to the brain if you wouldn't have reversed the flow. So when we reverse the flow, all that plaque went out of the patient's body and was captured by the filter. Next. What are the results? The results are showing that a month after doing this procedure, the rate of stroke is 1.4%. Next. When you compare now the three methodologies, this is open surgery, this is stents from the groin, and this is the new procedure. You can see how stents from the groin had a 4 in 100 chance of giving a stroke to somebody. Open surgery is about 2%, and now we're realizing that this new procedure is actually even lower, 1.4%. Next. So we start comparing one against the other. This is the comparison between stem from the groin, which is the CAS, versus the new procedure. Next. And you can see that 
statistically significant, there is less chances of the surgeon giving a stroke to a patient when you do TCAR, 1.5% versus 2.9% from the groin. It's almost double the risk of giving a patient a stroke when you put a stem from the groin. Next, next. Now, TCAR versus open surgery. Now we're comparing the standard of care, the operation that is 70 years old against this new procedure that is five years old. Next. And what do we find? This is a study done in every in inpatient in a hospital. Number one, you can see that people actually were, the people that had TCAR were older than people who had open surgery and they were sicker. They had much more comorbidities. Next. Despite that, it was a very similar rate of stroke. But after open surgery, 1.4%, and after TCAR, 1.6%. They were no different. But there was quite a difference in operative time. We can do a TCAR in a much shorter procedure than on open surgery. There was a less length of stay in the hospital, less use of, uh, more use of local anesthetic. So you can do this procedure with the patient awake and just local anesthesia as opposed to putting somebody to sleep completely. Next. And you can see that the in-hospital stroke rate, it was similar between open surgery and the new procedure. Next. Cranial nerve injury, obviously, if you make a little cut at the bottom of the neck, there's a much less chance of damaging the nerves than making a big incision all across the neck. And the operative time, on average, the surgeons did a open surgery in two hours, whereas the TCAR was performing a little over an hour. Next. When you see a comparison of all trials, these are orange, the trials in TCAR versus trials in open surgery, you can see that there's a trend for less strokes using TCAR than open surgery. We, have, we can say at this point that the rates are similar. Next. Next. In conclusion, this new procedure, TCAR, is a very promising new technique for carotid revascularizations and has equivalent stroke rates than open surgery. Now, of course, it's a technology that's only five years old, and as you know, there's a lot of things that haven't been studied long enough that are promising in the beginning, but then later on, it can show flaws. But at this point, uh, five years after this experience, TCAR is very comparable to open surgery. Now, what's known and what's clear in my mind is that TCAR is much better than putting a stem from the groin. And to me, most of those stents through the groin should be replaced by the new procedure TCAR, which is actually only able to be performed by vascular surgeons. Next. The problem is that, again, this is a very new technology, so we need to follow up people for longer to see if there's a long-term effect, meaning that open surgery, we know that people who had surgery 20, 30, 40 years ago, the operation remains good. This is only a five-year-old. And you can see in this example, for instance, a stent that was placed through TCAR. Look at the break. This stent used to be a single stent, but now it's broken a few years after the stent placement. And so some of these flaws will appear as follow-up increases, but at this point, it's a very promising and a very exciting technique to revascularize the um, carotid arteries. Next. With that, I want to thank you again for the uh, opportunity to present today. And if there's any other questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them at this point. Thank you again. <laughs>